In my early 20s, as I tell everybody, I grappled with a major depression, and I think in, to a certain extent it was brought on by my grappling with the question, is life worth living? Um, this is a question that is raised philosophically pretty much everywhere. My emphasis at the time was Eastern philosophy, um, coupled with, I suppose, the amount of disappointments that any young man feels by the time he's 25. Um, disappointments in life when your ideals are all being smashed <laughs> in good order. Um, well, I'll put it this way. I never quite answered that question satisfactorily to say, I guess as Nietzsche says, that life is worth living. Um, absolutely. I would say that it's an open question still. We don't have an answer to it. And that any attempt to create neat little formulae like Benatar has um, results in something artificial. His asymmetry uh, says that before existence there's no harm, during existence there is harm. Therefore, since you don't miss the good of existence, um, it's okay for you to miss the harm as well. In fact, you're better off. <clears throat> okay, that's nice. You can compare two completely separate things, uh, any two completely separate things in the universe, or in psychology, or in just conceptually, and come up with any kind of asymmetry that you want. I could compare, say, a Cadillac to a pomegranate and say that there's something fundamentally different between these two, something fundamentally um, better about a pomegranate um, as opposed to a Cadillac. If I'm lost in a desert, the pomegranate is a lot more useful to me than a Cadillac is. Unless, of course, we go by Quantum of Solace and drink the engine oil, but anyway. <laughs> um, what Benatar has done is he's taken two things that are artificial, but let's just say, let's just take them as they, as they are, as he, he uh, assume that they are what they are in his formula. Before life and during life, okay. Is there more to life than that? than the before and the during part. How about the after part? If he's going to talk about before life, you know, all right, fair enough, I'm game, but I want to talk about post-human beings as opposed to potential human beings. Potentials have been thoroughly dealt with. Let's play along with him. Um, <clears throat> he's invented this idea of a potential human being, and I'm willing to, as usual, follow him right down that rabbit hole and see where it goes. If we have a past, we've also got a future, right? Um, <clears throat> if there is some sort of past that is actually happening, or that is actually existent, um, then there is a future that is actually existent, because what will happen, will happen. And what did happen, did happen. Um, I often like quoting Omnia Exeunt. Um, in Rorschach's video, I left a comment. Caesar was not a human being at one point. He was he was uh, potential. Then he was born in a caesarean, so he came into <clears throat> came into life rather brutally. I can only imagine what an ancient Roman caesarean section would be like. His mother survived. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, then he lived a life of glory and power and um, was brutally dispatched from this plane of existence by the knives of, you know, about 30 or 40 senators. Um, one of the most spectacular murders in human history and probably excruciatingly painful. Um, not a nice way to go. Okay, pretty obvious, right? Um, not, existing, not existing is better than being brutally stabbed to death. <laughs> um, okay. What's better then? Um, feeling those knives stabbing you or not feeling those knives, knives stabbing you? Well, we'll say that feeling, not feeling those knives stabbing you. Okay. Um, in line with Omnia Exeunt or Pantahrai, five minutes after Caesar breathed his last onto the marble of the Senate floor, 
slimy with his own blood. Where was Caesar's pain at that moment? Where was Caesar's harm, his suffering? He's now no more. Well, <clears throat> if we're already going to play with Benatar's idea of um, him having uh, a future as a potential human being, then he has a future as an actual human being. And his future is complete divorce from all harm and um, complete... Like he's sloughing all harm off to the extent that, um, I guess, I don't know, a moth or a, sorry, a, a cocoon gets sloughed off by a butterfly. Uh, it just is no longer part of him. But then people say, well, he doesn't exist. He did exist. Therefore, he has a past, right? The same way that an actual human being has a past as a potential human being. <clears throat> um, you're going to compare his present existence with his past non-existence. Fine. I will compare his present existence with his future non-existence. Benatar doesn't do this. I wonder why. Well, it's, again, pomegranates and Cadillacs. Um, there's any number of things you could compare his actual life to. How about an ideal life? How about a life that he perceives, not a life that is even remotely examinable by anyone else, because it's based on his own experiences. Um, we don't have enough information to tell whether or not Caesar, at the moment of his death, said, wow, that was great, I want to do that again. <clears throat> a bit nasty there at the end, but <laughs> I want to get right back on that roller coaster, however crazy it is. You know, you see these in amusement parks you see gangs of uh, teenagers doing this they get on the roller coaster and then they just uh, as soon as they the, the ride is over they get off they go right around and go back back into the line and they just keep doing it over and over again uh, I did a little bit of that when I was younger assuming that the line wasn't too long um, so it is it does take on the dimensions of a massive gerrymander because he just takes two things as though uh, his own artificial construct of the potential human being and the actual human being are the only two factors in existence and the only two factors that could possibly be there. Rubbish. Uh, gerrymander. A massive gerrymander. <clears throat> a gerrymander that is so huge um, and so obvious that it positively reeks of religion. I would call it um, pessimistic apologetics. Uh, he's already made up his mind that life sucks and that the world sucks and that human beings are horrible. And you know, his his book is replete with guilt trips played upon human uh, human beings. Um, again, he's somehow, you know, as some of them have, uh, many of them have um, inserted guilt or moral responsibility into a deterministic universe, which is insane. Um, <clears throat> and even in a deterministic universe, if you're going to talk about potential human beings, then, you, then in a deterministic universe, there is most certainly a post-human being, an ex-human being or whatever. Because, again, in a deterministic universe, there's just cause and effect ad infinitum. Um, <clears throat> but he just sort of says, there's only one cause and one effect. <laughs> uh Sorry, Mr. Benatar, but it's a little bit more complex than that. And again, when you start narrowing things to that kind of very blatant uh, sort of black-white view of, of reality, I smell religion. Um, I smell belief. And that, I think, is ultimately where I've placed Benatar in my... Uh, in my um, my overall human canon. He's up there. He's, he's right beside people like John Knox or Martin Luther or Mohammed. He has discovered the good versus the evil and a woe to anyone who refuses to see it. Um, <clears throat> that's just Benatar. Um, the, um, the whole idea, though, 
is still left dangling. Is life worth living? And it's a fascinating one. Um, now, you know, anyone who's remotely interested in existentialism is going to be dealing with this question one way or another. Um, I think that that's a question that can only be answered from inside. It can only be answered by the person who's living the life. And I would say that it's almost impossible for even for that person to answer it. Because you're forced to ask yourself, is life worth living? Okay. Uh, is it worth living compared to what? Well, Benatar comes up with his asymmetry, which doesn't work. Um, <clears throat> so at least he's bothered to come up with um, some sort of formula to prove that it's not worth it. Even, even if it's a horrifically flawed faith-based uh, formula. <clears throat> the Christians have done the same thing to prove that life is worth living. Um, so, you know, it's, I, I just say that, again, I'm talking uh, religion here. I'm saying that Benatar is just the same thing as turning Christianity on its head. Uh, when you inflict or insert a huge amount of um, almost stereotypical Jewish guilt into that, you know, and I, and I don't mean that in in terms of Judaism, but I'm talking about the kind of guilt that gets parodied in Woody Allen movies or in Seinfeld or something, um, <clears throat> as opposed to Catholic guilt, which you know is also a big part of that, a big part of Benatar's uh, argument. But I would say it's more towards the um, "you are a bad person" type guilt. Uh, you are failing your fellow human beings. <laughs> You're letting us down, you bad person, after all we've done for you. Um, <clears throat> and again, I'm not singling out Catholics and Jews here. I'm just sort of dealing with the stereotypes that are usually uh, invoked to describe the guilt that is in inherent in both traditions. Believe you me, Catholic guilt is real. <laughs> it's something that really needs to be examined, if you ask me. Um, but if you can overcome it, you're, you, what doesn't kill you will make you stronger, and you'll feel a lot better. Um, <clears throat> but again, um, if somebody can come up with a fascinating and more compelling case than Benatar's to prove that life isn't worth living, he's essentially going to have to do a Nietzsche on Nietzsche, if you ask me. Um, because, again, I don't think that Nietzsche and his affirmation is debunkable in the same way that I would suggest that um, a person who's lived a terrible life, that their argument is debunkable. And when, when, when I do these arguments sometimes, when I do these debates with antinatalists sometimes, I get the impression that I'm being a little bit nasty because oftentimes I'm debating people who have not exactly had an ideal life. Um, I'm inclined to say that, um, okay, uh, I'm having a good life here. You, on the other hand, well, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> nothing I can do about that. <clears throat> well, uh, but I, you know, usually bite my tongue because, you know, I'm human pity, I suppose. You're dealing with people who have been dealt a bad hand in life uh, and they've embraced antinatalism for that reason or just not even antinatalism but life denial in general because there's any number of life denying philosophies out there. Um, I, as I say, I dealt with the Indian variant and the Indian variant did come to uh, the same kind of conclusion that I have is that there's no real answer. Even the Jains, who are the ultimate antinatalists, have sort of said, our message doesn't make much difference, and there's no way to stop the wheel of existence. Um, <clears throat> the only way to stop the wheel of existence is to destroy the universe. <laughs> it's not going to happen anytime soon. Um, <clears throat> but turning that on its head, if I'm going to point the finger at people and saying, you're antinatalist because you're miserable, um, or you're living a particularly nasty life, and, you know, you don't want my pity, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. Um, which, and I mean that. I truly mean that. I feel sorry for people who have had a horrible life. Um, <clears throat> but do I let that impact my life? No. Uh, I'm no more responsible for the fact that my life is what it is than somebody I've never met is responsible for the way their life is what it is. 
a long time ago, <clears throat> when I was um, engaging a fellow by the name of Too Many Minds on um, YouTube here, he, he does some poetry and everything. He's actually, I liked him. He essentially said, <clears throat> okay, on account of that, it's very nice of you to have this uh, philosophy that you've got, but it just smacks or reeks of, in his terms, convenience. Um, <clears throat> people look at the way I've portrayed my life here on YouTube and they say, well, it's all very well for you to say that, you know, life is worth living. Look look at all the goodies that you've got in life. You haven't had to dealt with all, deal with all the crap that I've had to deal with. I get it. I understand that argument. And that's where my pity comes in. But I'll tell you something about that argument, though. That argument that, oh, yeah, it's all very well for some people to say that life is great while, while others have to suffer. That's massive guilt, by the way. It assumes that <clears throat> some people, to some people, life is worth living. It assumes that if we switched places, I would be, uh, I would have too many minds as attitude, and he would have mine. Think about that. <clears throat> it's all very well for you to say that life is worth living. You don't have my problems. Ah, but that assumes that if you didn't have your problems, life would be living, worth living, right? I think that that's inescapable when you say, oh, it's all very well for you to say that, that you know, life is great. Um, that one little preamble to the accusation that, that follows, um, you know, if I were you, I would I would agree that life is worth living. If I were, you know, Donald Trump or I don't God knows who, Miley Cyrus or whatever, um, <clears throat> then I would believe that life was worth living. Unfortunately, what you've just done there is you've said that under certain circumstances life is worth living. I'm sorry, but you have, um, and you can and and by the same token, when you point to your own nasty s circumstances. You're saying that only because of these circumstances is life not worth living. If these circumstances were not present, then life would be worth living. They throw all kinds of things at you, like cluster headaches and famine, rape, slavery, you know, all this stuff is just re replete with all of this. And then they say, you're up there not suffering any of this, and you don't even give a damn about any of it. Well, you're horrible. Well, wait a minute. And, and, and Benatar does this as well. Wait a minute. You're saying that to some people life is worth living, aren't you? <laughs> it's an interesting thing when you look at it, look at it from every conceivable angle, what you come up with, the implications in what people are saying. Um, I have a horrible life. That's you know, I, what about me? How, where do I fit in here? My life has been unending agony, you know. Um, it's all very well for you spoiled people to say that life is good, but it's not good. It's not always good. What about me? I hate to say this. What about you? What about me? What about any of us? The guilt and finger pointing uh, is part of the argument. The anger and the abuse are part of the argument. <clears throat> Schadenfreude? I, pr I suppose so. Um, because depriving somebody else of their pleasure does uh, feel good in certain contexts, uh, whether you like it to admit it to yourself or not. We're all sadists. And even the biggest victim on earth can be a sadist. What is the old saying that the ancient Romans had? Um, I don't know it in Latin, but there is no worse master for a slave to have than a master who was once a slave himself. Think about that. 